Hey everyone, this is part two of the Kurzweil K2000R project. So uh, I did a part one, just kind of overview of all these units, a little bit of history and a little bit about the internals and options and things like that. So in this video, I'm just going to dive right into it and start working on this one. Uh, I chose this one. This is my original K2000R that I've had for a couple years now that uh, I mentioned in the first video that I would like to go through and kind of just do restoration on. So it needs a handful of things. Uh, the display is, is dark. It needs to be replaced, or at least the backlight replaced on it. We'll take a look at that. Uh, the power button you see here is broke, so I need to replace the power button there. Uh, these are almost, you know, they're going on 30 years old. This one's around 25 years old or so. So it's going to be at a point pretty soon here where uh, capacitors are going to start being a problem. This one, everything, as far as I can tell, seems fine, although a couple back here are starting to get the the cues that you know they're reaching end of life in terms of their appearance i mean there's not a lot in these things which is nice at least in the power supply section there's like 10 so it's not a big deal there uh, so i'm going to replace all those i'm going to update the firmware i'm going to add more ram i'm probably going to put the uh, uh orchestral module that i have in one of the other ones into this guy as well i'll go through i just took this outside too i, I took the air compressor blew out, at least not all the dust but most of the dust out of it the surface dust there there's still a little bit of residue inside here but it's much cleaner than it was and then as part of the series too, I'm going to talk about the hardware. Uh, there's some interesting things going on uh, inside here. I talked a little bit about it in the part one uh, video, but not really in depth. So uh, if there's time in this video, I'll do that. If not, it'll be another future video. So uh, first up, just to take it apart. I'm just going to start uh, disassembling essentially. They've almost got, it's almost like scotch tape. They have holding these cables in place just as kind of a, uh, just something to hold them down. It's kind of unusual. What it's worth, it's strong. Wow, these definitely don't want to just come out. Those are the same, at least size. I don't want to mix those up, so I'm going to label them real quick. Just put an E on this one for engine board. And power. So here's the engine board. We'll take a closer look at that a little bit later. And then in the bottom here we have the uh, the power of the audio board, as uh, as Kurzweil calls it. There's the audio board. You can see those awesome analog devices, digital analog converters, and then this massive filtering section for them as well. But the power supply is nice because it's you know it's just a straight linear power supply, nothing fancy about it. It's just a handful of capacitors in this area here. And then the audio circuitry too. You've got some capacitors over here. Uh, they don't even look to be non-polarized. Uh, just this part of the filtering and then around the, the, the DACs over here as well. So, like some gear that's just awful, you know, you, you look at some like the Yamaha FX processors I've worked on, you know, where there's like 150 capacitors in there, this is pretty minimal for this device, which is, which is really, really nice. So all the capacitors in here are Sam Young, Young branded um, caps, and uh, there's, there's mixed opinions if they're good or not in terms of, you know, quality. 
for what it's worth, I mean, they're, they're stock in here as far as I can tell. Nobody's ever replaced them. There's no solder touched on this board. And, you know, they last 25 years with no real evidence of leaking, at least these big ones here. So it's interesting because if you look at the logo on these capacitors, you can see it there. Maybe. Maybe not. Anyway, it, it's the Nippon Chemicon logo. It just says Sam Young inside it. And Sam Young is like, a, it's a joint subsidiary or venture or whatever you want to call it of Nippon Chemicon and it's based out of Korea. So are they the same caps? Maybe. I don't know. It's up in the air for it. But regardless, like I mentioned, I'm just replacing them anyway just as maintenance because they're going to go bad at some point. And since I'm in here and I'm doing all this, I just want to do it now and get it done with. So capacitors I'm going to be using are Panasonic's. Uh, I've got a ton of them and I use them for everything. Always 105C rated uh, in everything whenever I do it. There's no reason not to. There's not a big cost between them. I know if you watch my videos you're probably going to see that all the time. Anyway, uh, the only ones I had to buy were was this big one here which is a 33,000 microfarad at 16 volts. So I got some new Panasonic's for those and I bought a couple of them. These, that's the only one that's really expensive. They're six or seven bucks a piece or something like that. So I'm going to get all these replaced. Uh, I'm not going to film much of this just because it's not that all exciting. Okay, so I've completed the capacitor replacements board. Again, went pretty quick. They're really all wasn't all that many. Uh, in terms of the ones I replaced, there was only a couple that looked questionable. Uh, that 4700 microfarad was kind of iffy. And a couple of the uh, ones around the regulators there. There's a little 100 microfarads. Is that one? Is that one? I could just tell they were getting a little leaky. But uh, I could test them with an ESR meter and see, but it doesn't matter. Um, so I'm going to take this uh, back to the garage again, hit it with the air compressor again, just blow some dust off of here. With the, the uh, engine board on top of this, I couldn't quite get it. I just want to get it a little bit cleaner. Besides that, on the engine board, there's only what, two capacitors I think there is. I've got one over there, one over there. So I'll just go ahead and replace those for good measure as well. All right, the two capacitors on the engine board are replaced. you got a 470 microfarad here and a 22 microfarad there. So I'm going to drop these boards back in the chassis, power it up, make sure everything's good there. And then we can go on and tackle a few other things. Uh, I'll probably do the front panel LCD next. This is the tape I'm going to use to uh, mount this uh, shield back onto those uh, inductors right there. So it's just double-sided sticky tape. This is actually thermal conductive tape too. Um, not that it matters for this, but it's what I have and it will work for now. engine board, put that back in. That's the minimum you need just to power it on to see if it works. So, so next steps I'm going to tackle the front panel issues here. So. Like I mentioned, the LCD, I'm going to take that out, look into either replacing or replacing the backlight on it. Uh, I'm not sure which I'm going to do yet on this unit. And then the power switch. I've got to replace the power switch because it completely is, is broken off on there. So I've got my parts unit that I'm actually going to use for the power switch and the switch itself to replace on there. That parts unit also has a good display, possibly. I don't know if the backlight, the backlight's probably dead on that one too, but it's something worth checking anyway. front panel. So it comes apart easy. There's two screws in the top, four on the bottom, and then you just got to remove the, uh, the nut holding on the, the headphone jack there. And then that comes completely off. And then once inside you've got access to basically everything on this unit without having to remove the back panel. So what's nice is the display, it sits here on its own board obviously, and it's on four different standoffs as well sitting on here. 
because the issue with the the displays when you replace them is the the modern ones that I usually buy they're no longer EL backlight they're LED backlight but because of that they're a little bit thicker and as a result they don't always fit in within the case between the front face plate and the uh, you know the, the the back metal here so what this allows you to do is with these standoffs is you can cut these down and give yourself a little bit depth because you can see how much room you have behind the display right here to be able to fit that new one in but before I go that route I'm just going to look in to see if I can actually replace the EL backlight on this it should be possible So here's the display once removed from the actual unit. Uh, just two cables on there. This is your data power cable to actually run the display. And then you've got this little cable here that goes to the high frequency drive, a high voltage high frequency drive that sits right in the back here. This just runs your EL panel, which sits right underneath the display. So the replacement route, you, know, you can buy these displays from eBay, among other sources. There's, there's companies that make them, and you can see they're pretty much an exact size uh, replacement which is nice, you know, spec-wise they are basically identical, even the pinouts are in the correct spots, which is nice. The only major difference is, is like I said, one, it's slightly thicker. If you can see there, is that in frame? Yeah, kind of. So it's it's mis misleading because this, this black bezel here is actually part of the front panel that sits on there. So to replace the display, you actually need to pull this off carefully, the front of the display, and then put it back on this one, which would increase the thickness of it quite a bit. Uh, you want that on there just to give it, you know, the nice finished look. You need it there. But uh, that's what I was saying about the space-wise, you know, depth-wise. You need to have more room so this can sit just slightly back further into the actual unit. And that's where you can, you know, do this. Now, to modify it, you know, it's some work. You got to take the board off, take this middle plate off here, and then take it, you know, there's a couple different ways to grind these down the safest way, you know, do with a saw but it'd be better if you did it you know something a little bit more controlled surface where you're actually holding these so you don't bend and break them and then you can mill them down or something like that in the mill that'd be the safe way to do it but if you're careful you can just do it with a drum or something as well and they're threaded pretty far in there so you've got plenty of threads as well even cutting these down a little bit to put it on now interestingly the k2500 made a modification to the unit where the four screws sitting here that hold this panel on uh, are actually slotted so you can slide this whole panel forward and back. And what that allows you to do is move it just back just a little tiny bit just to give you enough space to, to slide this display in there. But uh, for this unit, I think I'm gonna go with replacing the EL backlight route. And to do that, you just buy the replacement you know, EL strips. Uh, there's a couple companies that sell these. You just need to find the right size. They're you know, not expensive, a couple dollars a piece, uh, again, from China. So you don't mind waiting a few weeks to receive them. But what it does is it slips right behind the display right here. You can see the two uh, tabs right there you would solder this on. Now, you can get these in multiple colors as well. Uh, I think some of these are white, some are blue. I'm gonna power some up and see if I can remember exactly what they were. I've got a little driver I can, I can test these with real quick. And there it is. So they come out pretty easy. And you can see it's basically identical to the set I have here. So next is I just need to see what color these are before I decide which one I'm gonna put in there. I've got my little high voltage supply right here and I've got it wired up to this EL panel. So let's power that one on. That one is blue. Looks blue anyway. It's uh Definitely blue, it's pretty bright. And then, let's see what the other ones are. I think the other ones are white. Nope, that one's blue too, or kind of a bluish white. Yeah, that one's even a deeper blue. That one's actually pretty nice as well. 
I'll probably use that one. I like that one. Is it brighter? Which one's brighter? This one's almost a turquoise. Oh, I like the darker blue. I might go that one. Alright. So, replacement. It's just like taking it apart. Just slides in. Make sure it's clean. Yep, and then solder it down. Okay, now we can power it up and see how it looks. There we go. Very nice. The contrast is digitally adjustable on these displays too from the menu inside the in, one of the setup menus and the configuration menus inside the unit. So even though it doesn't look, the contrast doesn't look great now, it'll be better once you adjust that. Actually, let me just do that right now as soon as it comes up. I need this, I know what button to press. Um, master, I think it was. Yeah, master then contrast right here. So you can bring that up. Not that much. One, four or five looks pretty good. So it looks pretty good there, I think, to you too. But the uh, display is pretty bright, and the lighting in here, it's hard to see. But uh, when I dim the lights or turn the lights off, you can see it was you know, blinding. So again, it's not going to be as bright as you know one of the really nice LED-backed uh, lights you can or displays that you can buy. But since I've got multiple of these to do, I'll still do this, but I'll do it in a separate video on a different unit, uh, so I can show the process of you know upgrading it with the. Uh, LED backlight, the brand new display, which these are really, really bright and beautiful. But when you're buying these two, don't be fooled on eBay by people selling the auctions that are like, you know, display for the K2000R or 2500R, whatever it may be sent out there. Because there are some exceptions where some, you know, pieces of gear have pretty unique displays that need custom interfaces or wiring, whatever it might be. For the most part, there's nothing special about it. It's just a standard display with a standard interface that everything uses. And these are like, 20 bucks, 25 bucks, I think, on eBay. So compared to people trying to sell them for an 80 or 90 or whatever they want for them. So just keep an eye out for that. And then same with these. I found these on eBay. You gotta search around for them quite a bit, but I think they were only five or six dollars for the replacement EL display. So again, lifespan on these is limited. It won't last forever, but you know, you'll get five or 10 years out of it easily, even if you use this quite a bit. While you have the faceplate off as well, this is a good time to clean it. So you can get around all the buttons as well and get kind of the grime off you know, the top of the buttons. So I've just got my uh, tech spray uh, plastic and glass cleaner. I've said before in many other videos and stuff, when you're cleaning this, when you're cleaning gear like this, don't use Windex, don't use anything with ammonia. You know, it's gonna, it's gonna damage the display and don't use paper towel. Uh, paper towel is abrasive. It will uh, damage your gear. Two last things I want to fix before I uh, put this front you know, faceplate back on is one, I gotta do the power switch. So I'm gonna steal the switch off the donor machine I have, the, the parts machine, uh, and replace that there. You can see the, the shafts of it's actually broken off, so I need to replace the whole switch. I can't just put the cap on. Two, the uh, encoder here, it kind of wobbles because you know, as people are pushing on it, spinning around, it, it, it's just offset. So there's a set screw on here that you can loosen to take off and then tighten to get it back on. I'm just going to see if I can adjust this thing. And get it off. There it goes. Wow. This is a uh, solid piece of aluminum. Look at that. That's actually pretty cool. Actually looks like it's cast. Yeah. Either way, the milled, painted, powder coated. 
It's got some heft to it, though. That's cool. I mean, to turn this knob, it feels really nice, and that kind of matches up to that experience, I guess. So, anyway, so your encoder is right here. If your encoder went bad, that is where you replace it. Uh, it's just, you know, it's soldered on this board, and there's just a single screw right here. So you'd pop this board off, uh, and that's your encoder. Unscrew that. Three wires to to unsolder it, and then it comes off. So it's pretty simple to replace. It's not much work. That's better. It's not perfect, but it's significantly better than it was. The, the problem is the set screw is like indented the shaft. It's just a plastic shaft in that encoder. So it's kind of, when you tighten it down, it wants to bend it, but it's all right. It's better than it was, so I'm okay with it. All right, so I'm gonna get that switch off the other unit and put it in this one. Uh, it should come out pretty easily. I believe it's just the two screws there. see how the actual front of the switch there is broken off. Hold on to this though, I'm going to have to find another one because I do have another one of these units that also has a broken switch. So here's the replacement switch I stole from the other unit along with the uh, aluminum button as well that goes on there. So I'm going to reinstall this. So everything's good where I'm at right now. I think I'm gonna pause this video at the moment and continue in the next one. So next video, we're gonna cover the engine board. Uh, we'll go over the a lot of the hardware on that board along with some of the hardware too. I didn't really get a chance to discuss in this video the, the hardware on the actual main board. And then we're gonna do the EEPROM updates. So both the uh, setup ROMs, we'll check those and also update the actual engine ROMs. Uh, RAM, I'm gonna update the RAM on it. So I could throw some more memory in there. I'll talk about that. And then I'm probably going to take the, uh, I've got a second, I've got another one of my units that's got the, um, one of the ROM expansion boards. So I think I might take that out of there. That's got the orchestral ex expansion on it and, and installed in this unit. Then I've still got the floppy drive emulator to do as well. And I still haven't made the decision if I'm going to, if I'm going to put a uh, SCSI to SD converter in this unit or one of my other ones. So I got to think about that some more. So that completes this video. Hopefully this information was useful to you and thank you for watching.